In this presentation, I'm going to discuss what I think is often the hardest part of any research endeavor, including those that I engage in myself. So basically, that is defining exactly what you're going to study. Trust me that articulating a concise and focused research problem and associated research questions is not as easy or straightforward as it seems when you're just reading a study. But it's a very important process because it shapes everything you do from that point forward. And the same goes for the project you're going to do in this course. So we're going to spend some time right now and then also in the face-to-face -face class discussing what research topics, problem statements, study purposes, and questions are. The development of a research idea is a process of narrowing your topic at its broadest level to a specific set of questions as illustrated in the flowchart on this slide. So I'm going to start by discussing in this presentation what exactly a research topic is. So as you can see up here, oops, sorry, it can be defined as the broad subject matter area that you will investigate in your study. So how do researchers go about even identifying the broadest topic area they're interested in studying? Their inspiration can actually come from a lot of different sources. So certainly many studies are inspired by theories that pr uh, propose to explain processes that occur in higher education. Uh, I noted in a prior presentation that human capital theory is a commonly used theory by economists who study financial and sort of economic questions in higher education research. And my research actually often draws not so much from human capital, but theories that others have developed um, in, from, in organizational studies and tested in for-profit settings and companies and other sort of different types of organizations. I'm interested in applying those theories to colleges and universities. So for example, one study I did with colleagues at Michigan tested a theoretical framework that successfully explained employees' perceptions of organiz organizational politics in corporations. So we, my co-authors and I, used that theory that was developed in corporations to test and see whether or not it explained professors' beliefs about the political aspects of their campus's intercollegiate athletics programs. So, oh, sorry, that was the example. So another uh, source of information that can inspire topics is um, published literature reviews or existing studies. So oftentimes, articles will include in their discussion section at the very end some implications or directions for subsequent studies that come from their own findings. So for example, last year I finished another study of, uh, sorry, I lost my place, another study of university faculty. So the project examined differences in the workplace experiences of professors who are in tenure line positions and those who are off the tenure track. My inspiration came from reading an article by a professor at USC, Adriana Kazar, and she was critiquing studies that had already been done of non-tenure track faculty for using theoretical frameworks that assume they're somehow less qualified, less motivated, less fit for being professors than those who are on the tenure track. So basically most studies treat non-tenure track faculty as blue collar workers and then tenure line faculty as white collar professionals. So her article called for researchers to study non-tenure track faculty using different theoretical frameworks, non-deficit frameworks. And then um, after reading her article, calling for this next step, that is exactly what I did. So I did a study pursuing that next step. Another source of inspiration can be studies that are already published that you as a researcher can expand upon or alter the direction of. An example of this is actually my dissertation. So five or six years ago, I studied the relationship between educational attainment and who entered high level circles of power within the corporate world. So my inspiration for that dissertation came specifically from a study that had been published in the 1980s by two sociologists, Michael Yusim and Jerome Carabell. So their study data were collected in the 1970s, but the article itself is still cited and discussed in the literature now, even though it's pretty old. So in 2010, I collected data from, updated data from different corporate executives now using the same procedures that they did to collect data 40 years ago. And I, with my dissertation, my study, updated their findings because a lot has changed over the past 40 years in the educational backgrounds of the corporate elite. 
So finally, and this is something that I think and I hope will probably be the case for most of your projects right now, your research interest should definitely be informed by your personal observations of practice and your own experiences. And this actually cuts across all of my examples above as well. So my undergraduate degree is in business, which inspired my use of organizational theory in my research. I'm really well informed about those kinds of frameworks and how to study organizations, including universities, from those perspectives. Um, and then topically, I also do a lot of studies on faculty, especially those who are teaching off the tenure track, because I was in that type of position before I came to Arizona State, and I observed a lot of problems associated with those types of faculty appointments. So it's something I'm actually really, really passionate about and experienced myself. So for your own projects, I encourage you to think about your own experiences in higher education as an administrator or as a future administrator, as an undergraduate student or as a graduate student. So what is especially interesting to you? At this point, really don't, don't worry too much about the logistics of how to do a study. Think more about topics and issues that you can see yourself delving more into and hopefully improving practice. And we'll discuss this for sure when we meet in the face-to-face -face class. As part of this presentation, um, throughout this presentation, I'm going to go through an example that's aligned with your first assignment, starting with the research topic. So in your first assignment, you're going to need to identify a research topic that you plan to focus on for your project. So the example I'll use in this presentation is from my own practice, like I said, important to draw from your own practice, as Arizona State University's faculty coordinator of the higher and post-secondary education program. So I've been really concerned about the hybrid format of, format of our courses and how to best utilize this design. So as a research topic, I could study higher education program course designs, as we see on the screen. So note that's a very broad area of interest. So I'm not yet getting into my problems or issues with the program's course designs or what specifically I'm going to study. The research topic is basically very general that my idea is encompassing. So once you identify a general topic area, you should then start to think about what within there you'd like to study. Your next step is to articulate what we call a research problem. So this is basically defined as the educational issue or problem within your broad topic area. So like this, the prayer slide said, the research problem is a specific issue you want to study. And in your problem statement, which is basically at least several paragraphs that describe and expand upon that specific problem, you need to articulate why the issue needs attention. So you want to do something that you think is useful or important to you personally or your office or other people, and also you shouldn't waste the time of your participants. In fact, when researchers um, from a university apply for institutional approval of their studies, which we'll discuss more in the final week of this course, they're required to explain who will benefit from the study and how. Universities don't want people doing research that will uh, not help improve practice or our larger understanding of a social problem. Okay, so when you actually go to write your problem statement, to compile those paragraphs that explain what your problem statement is, I have several tips for you. So first of all, this seems kind of self-evident, but I'd like you to use, and a good problem statement is to use non-technical language and avoid jargon or abbreviations. So let's say you're interested in doing a study of whether a new tutoring program on your campus affects athletes' graduation rates. So the way that athletes' graduation rates are measured by the NCAA is by a metric called the APR, or the Academic Progress Rate. So that's a pretty technical term, right? Academic Progress Rate. In your problem statement, you'd want to use the term graduation rate. So maybe I'm interested in whether a tuition program, or I'm sorry, a tutoring program will improve graduation rates, as opposed to saying whether, whether it will improve APR. So most of your readers should know what a graduation rate is, but many will not know what APR stands for. 
Eventually, in your methodology, you'll explain that APR is how you measure graduation rates, but for the problem statement, you want to keep it really basic. Avoid jargon. So, also when you're writing your problem statement, think about ways to stimulate your reader's interest. Maybe an anecdote that represents the problem, or maybe a statistic, like only 20% of men's basketball players earn a college degree, compared to 80% of student athletes in other sports. Something like that, a compelling beginning to really draw in your reader. Also think about limiting your scope to a manageable problem. So this is uh, sort of an art that you'll develop, but maybe if you're interested in studying an athlete's tutoring program, you might focus on just the Pacific 12 Conference, or even just Sun Devil ASU Athletics, or even if it was perhaps for just the project in this course, maybe just the men's basketball team, as opposed to studying all college sports programs across the entire United States. That's a massive scope that's really unfeasible for most studies. This is often feedback that I'll give after you submit your first problem statement draft. So many times, beginning researchers will identify great problems, but they're described on the scale of a PhD dissertation or even an entire career's worth of research. So a final hint, and I probably will give a lot of feedback about this as well from your first draft, is that it's important to substantiate whatever claims you're making in your problem statement. So you want to fit your problem within the context of current theory research or other observations, and you want to make it clear what information you're using to base your problem on. So, for example, back to the tutoring situation. Maybe your problem begins with a statistic. Only 20% of men's basketball players graduate with a college degree within four years. I'm totally making this up, by the way. But if it was a real statistic, you'd need to cite where you got it. Or, perhaps, if you're observing the problem for your from your own vantage point as a practitioner, let's say you're an academic coach who works for Sun Devil Athletics, if that's the case, you can begin your problem, your problem statement for your paper by explaining, as the men's basketball team academic coach at Arizona State, I'm concerned about the athlete's progress to degree. Many players have told me that they struggle with time management, blah, 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 whatever. Just clearly substantiate the basis of your claim, either from an external source, so cite it using APA, or make it clear that your claim is coming from your own experience as a professional or as a practitioner, as a student, etc. Substantiate your claims. All right, to give you a quick example of a problem statement, I'll explain in more detail um, what I'm planning to focus on within my broader topic area of Higher Education 573 Applied Inquiry. Um, so as a reminder, um, my topic was the program's course design specific to the hybrid program. Okay, so here, here's a research problem that I might propose within that broad topic of higher education program course designs. So here's my problem statement. Several years ago, Arizona State University's higher education program, note that I spelled out all of those words and then I added abbreviations um, as need to be, so avoiding jargon or avoiding using um, abbreviations that people might not know. So our program decided to convert all of our courses to hybrid format, condensing a 15-week face-to-face course into a seven and a half intensive week schedule. Again, I defined right there what this hybrid format is because not every reader is going to know what specifically that means. So continuing on, higher education faculty were required to make this transition with little expert input or resources. As the director of the higher ed program, so note, I'm substantiating sort of how I'm, I'm, um, I'm observing this problem with my own position and my own experiences. As the director of the program, I'm concerned that the hybrid courses are not designed to optimize student learning and satisfaction. So since I'm teaching applied inquiry, I want to redesign this course to better take advantage of the hybrid format and to improve students' experiences. <clears throat> so. I think there's clearly a problem stated here, I mean maybe that's because I wrote it, but the utilization of these course designs, that's the problem. So what's going on with these courses we don't know and we're concerned that it might not be optimizing student learning. So with my study I'm going to try to improve it by implementing this flipped course format and seeing if it improves learning, but I haven't gotten there yet. So right now really I'm framing the problem. I need to, um, we need to better understand and better improve the hybrid uh, format. 
So that's one example, but in class note, we'll also review some example problem statements from prior projects when we meet. So don't feel too overwhelmed if you don't feel like you have a good grasp on what it takes after listening to me and reading the article. But I encourage you to really think about this and to come to class prepared with questions if you don't understand exactly what a research problem statement is, because it's very important to uh, your learning in this course and your performance in this course. Once you have your topic, and your problem clarified, you next want to state the purpose of your study. So essentially, this is pretty straightforward, but the research purpose is a statement, a short statement, of the intent or objective of your study. Your research purpose statement should typically include, first of all, the key variables you'll focus on. So reminder that I defined what a variable is in the introduction to research presentation that you should have already watched. So if you're doing a quantitative study and have multiple variables, your purpose statement will also likely clarify or should clarify the relationships between those variables. You'll also want to include a description of the subjects or participants that you plan to focus on in your study. So I'm going to give you two examples. One is a more quantitative purpose statement and one is a more qualitative one. So first the quantitative example. Remember quantitative numerical. Uh, so the purpose of this study is to investigate the effect of a new tutoring program on college students' grades in introductory algebra. So as you can see, the purpose statement is pretty limited and specific. The variables here would be, first of all, the tutoring program, and that's actually our independent variable of interest, although we'll get to what independent and dependent variables are in a future um, two weeks discussion. So. Don't worry about that right now, but tutoring program is one of the variables of interest, and the other is grades. So we're interested in the relationship between a tutoring program and grades. And note that that relationship, that we're looking at that relationship, is specified with the word effect. So the study is going to look at whether or not there's a relationship between the two. We're not going to examine grades, like what do college students' grades look like, or separately, what does an effective tutoring program look like? No, we're specifying here very specifically in our problem st or purpose statement that we're going to look at the relationship between the tutoring program and grades. And in terms of the subjects involved, it's very clear that the study is going to focus on college students, right? And more specifically, those enrolled in algebra. So we achieve um, all of those typical sort of components that are listed above on the slide. So for a qualitative purpose statement, those are typically more verbose and open-ended to allow for more exploration of themes that emerge during the study. So here's an example. So as you can see, um, the focus of this study was to explore distressing and nurturing encounters of community college students with student affairs professionals and to ascertain the meaning that are engendered by such encounters. Using a phenomenological approach, the study was conducted at a community college in Phoenix, Arizona. So as you can see, the variables of interest here are a bit more broad than in the quantitative study. So the focus is really on the interactions um, between and encounters between community college students and student affairs professionals, right? These two groups of stakeholders and trying to define and understand those encounters. So again, it's very clear who the subjects involved will be, right? So both community college students, not any college students, but specific, specific to community college students, and student affairs professionals at uh, a college in Phoenix, Arizona. That's the setting. So returning to my own personal example of my pretend research um, situation, as a reminder, my topic is higher ed program course designs. I've shortened my problem, basically summarizing it, concerns about students' experiences in applied inquiry. So to my research purpose, um, here's a way I could state it. So the purpose of this study is to understand the effects that a flipped instructional approach has on higher ed student satisfaction with the applied inquiry course. So this is likely going to be a quantitative problem statement because I'm interested in focusing on and measuring the relationship between the flipped course, which is my independent variable, and how that might impact student satisfaction, my dependent variable. Note the narrow focus of my purpose. Um, so I'm not trying to make any statements about other settings, like for instance, the diversity in higher ed course or the intro in higher ed course, very specific to applied inquiry, that's my setting. Or about any other 
outcomes, variables, or interventions. So no other, you know, instead of student satisfaction, maybe somebody could study student persistence or, um, you know, student engagement, blah, 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 other kinds of variables. No, I'm just focusing on student satisfaction and I'm not going to look at any other course intervention besides flipping, like, you know, I mean, in a tutoring program or something like that. No, what I'm mainly focused on is just the flipped, flipped course design. A few things to think about when you're articulating your purpose statement. First, make sure it's researchable. So this seems obvious, but actually there are many things that cannot be examined using scientific inquiry. For instance, let's say my purpose was, I. the purpose of this study is to determine whether or not Arizona State University is better than the University of Arizona. That is not researchable as it's worded, since the term better has no real concrete meaning in the research context. What is better? That's a very subjective term. Better in terms of I'm a professor at U of A or at ASU and I think we're better than our colleagues at, at U of A? Uh, no. So you would need to be more specific and take out the word better and say maybe graduation rates or student learning or value or student satisfaction. That question could become researchable as a purpose statement, but only if you were to define and be clear about what better is. Um, so in terms of also, you want to make sure the topic has significance, right? So to the field, to your workplace, to sort of um, other students, to your colleagues, etc. And realistically, you also want to ensure that the research will not raise any logistical or political issues for you, um, and also that you have the resources available and the time available to actually do it. So for instance, one of my former students studied faculty salaries at ASU. She was interested in uh, gender differences and faculty salaries and faculty salary negotiations. She originally wanted to study all faculty, and so she realized to contact them, she needed to go to different departments' websites and copy individual email addresses. That was logistically really infeasible given the time that it would take. So she then decided to limit her study to faculty with the rank of full professors who were um, teaching in the liberal arts and sciences uh, college. So that's fine. You just need to be pragmatic and think about the resources that are available and also the time you have, and specifically too to this course, the artificial, um, I guess, limitations imposed by the fact that you have to get your proposal done in seven weeks and then finish your study in um, the subsequent seven and a half weeks. So also something that I just want to, uh, I don't know, bring up, uh, you, your positionality also, not just as a researcher and thinking about your purpose, but then also as a reader or consumer of research to be critical and think about other studies' purposes when you're engaging with, with the research that's already out there. Be attentive to the purpose statements and be critical as to whether or not they're important and of interest to the higher education world. You want to be attentive also to whether or not the presentation of the statement is biased or unbiased. It should be unbiased. And we're going to re re, um, sorry, review some examples of different purpose statements from prior projects in our face-to-face -face class. So you'll have a better sense of, kind of, as a reader, how to be critical and how to think about and identify whether or not topics seem to be important and especially whether or not they're presented clearly and objectively. After you have your topic, problem, and purpose statements all articulated, your final step for purposes of our course is to shape your purpose into one or more research questions. Essentially, in a quantitative study, a question that asks about, well, in, in our situation, one or two or more variables. And in qualitative research, a question about some sort of process issue or phenomenon to be explored. Note at the bottom, um, sort of in this flow chart, in many social science research studies, researchers also generate hypotheses about what they think will happen. For purposes of this course, we're actually not going to be including hypotheses in our proposals or our research projects, unless you want to, go for it, if you want to include a hypothesis. Um, however, research question, purpose, problem, and topic are all required. So, research questions. Typically, quantitative research questions ask about the extent to which either a single variable is present or, more commonly, about relationships among variables. So when a research question is about one variable, it's called a descriptive question. So there's an example of a descriptive question up there on the screen. 
how frequently do college students study? So you could answer it with, I don't know, one hour a day, one hour a week, 30 minutes a month, whatever. Uh, so it's a quantitative research question because the answer is a number, right? Correlational research questions investigate whether or not there are relationships between two or more variables. So here's a bivariate, so bivariate, two variables, quantitative research question. So the example is, what is the relationship between time spent studying and grades for college students? So you could answer this question by calculating the correlation coefficient between these two variables, grades and time, which is basically um, an easy calculation that if you do a quantitative research project, we'll discuss how to do that in uh, subsequent courses, or I mean subsequent lectures. But again, no, the answer would be a number. Qualitative research questions, on the other hand, ask about issues or phenomena and they're more generally stated, just like the um, purpose statements, than quantitative research questions. So here is an example up here on the screen. So how do college students make choices about time allocation? So within the same sort of general genre of topic areas, right, like studying, um, time, whatever, but as you can see here, how would you answer that question with a number? No, it's about a process. Uh, and you can't really reduce it to some sort of easy quantitative answer. Um, so a characteristic, though, of good research questions, regardless of whether or not they're quantitative or qualitative, and this is really important, and I'm going to give some of you this feedback, you need to phrase it in a way that cannot be simply answered yes or no. So a proper research question should suggest a debate that's still open. A question that could be answered definitively once and for all is not likely to be very interesting. So you should not ask, do college students make choices about time allocation? Yes or no. Or do college students study? Yes or no. Note how I phrase these questions to be much more open-ended. I'm returning to my fun example about the hybrid courses. So we've got up here my topic, my problem, summarize problem, the purpose statement, and now the research question. So I pose this question. What is the effect of a flipped instructional approach on higher ed student satisfaction with applied inquiry? Uh, so you can see, for, especially for quantitative research questions, they're very similar often to the purpose statement. However, you need to include both in your assignment and also in your final proposal. This is very important. A lot of, not a lot, but some students end up just including one or none sometimes. No, you need to include both a purpose statement and your question, even if it feels sort of forced. Um, but we'll get, I'll explain more as we go forward and start talking about how to analyze data as to why it's important to have both of those included. Um, but note too, like I said in the prior slide, I did not phrase my question as, does a flipped instructional approach have an impact on student satisfaction? Uh, so you could answer that one with yes or no, but I'm interested more in what is the effect. Maybe there's no effect, but phrasing it in this way allows me to answer it in a more involved and an in-depth way than just saying yes, no, or it depends. So you want to be attentive to that as you're thinking about how to phrase a research question. And it's not always easy to, it isn't actually easy to phrase research questions. And so we're going to have time to give one another feedback and I'll give you a lot of feedback and um, sort of some of your administrators who are working with you will give you feedback to help you try to hone your question in a really focused, solid way. But don't feel bad about getting feedback in this situation. It's much more about learning. Don't worry about your grade. Now I want to cover a bit about what goes into the full research report. So this is not just your assignment. This is a full research report that would um, be for this course and applied inquiry, but then also more broadly for any project that you might pursue in the future using inquiry-based methods. So the first section of a research report is typically uh, the introduction. And so in that section of your proposal, you'll include and discuss your problem, purpose, and research questions. You will include those in your final proposal for this class. This is a situation where I'm being very clear. You can plagiarize off of yourself. Do not plagiarize anyone else, but your first assignment should go right into or inform into your research report. 
Your report should be in narrative form. It shouldn't be in an outline or anything like that. So you might have to add you know, some sentences or words to make it flow or whatever. But you should use your first assignment and incorporate it into your final proposal for this course and then carry it forward into your capstone, full capstone research project. Anyways, so the introductory section of that report should include your research problem as well as your study purpose and research questions. So a typical research report will include a theoretical framework. You're not going to need to include that for this study unless you want. We'll talk about that in next week's course, but you do not need a theoretical framework. However, you will need to include a discussion of literature, prior literature and research that informs your topic. So a literature review. Then, in addition, the other sections of a research report are the methods, the methodology, which we will actually discuss and include in your research proposal. So this, these, these segments up here on the screen are the components of a research proposal. And then when you actually keep going forward and do the study, you'll include your results, a discussion of your actual finding, what you found. And then also finally a discussion of how those might be useful and the implications for both practice and further research. So actually in your proposal I'm going to have you include a short discussion about some of the impact that your study might have potentially and who, which stakeholders might benefit from it. Um, but we can talk about that more in class and that's articulated more in the assignment instructions. But essentially, these are the main components of a final research report. Um, and also, I want to note that there are several examples in this week's folder on Blackboard of research proposals from this course. So that include the introduction um, piece as well as the methodology and a short discussion section. So please refer to those if you're interested in understanding more about the specific expectations for the final proposal in this course. So just some final points. Okay, so again, I've said this before, a good topic, problem, etc. takes practice. That's partially why I'm flipping this class, actually, so we can spend our time together applying these ideas to real life situations and to your own ideas. Um, so these components are indeed the essential foundation of any research study, not just this capstone project, and no pressure, but as you'll see, these components that I've discussed in this presentation shape and frame everything else that will come forward in the course. So in the face-to-face -face class, um, we, I'm going to have some time to answer questions about the online lectures and the readings I've assigned. So please come prepared with those questions. If you don't ask questions, I'll assume everything was crystal clear, which I'm doubtful that's the case. But hey, if you have no questions, that's what I'll assume. And then we will also review examples of research topics, problems, and questions and critique those. So hopefully you've been paying attention to attributes in this presentation of good topics, problems, and questions. And then also I'm going to give you time to workshop through and work on ideas for your own topics and even your problems and questions in class. So it's going to be a lot of fun and I look forward to seeing you there.